Happy Kimmers. Today's lecture is going to be on the chemistry of color and the different color systems. Now this will be a bit of a review for those of you who had me for PCHEM, uh, PCHEM 1 at least, uh, but for those out there uh, who are new to the topic of forensic chemistry, this will be a great uh, lecture on what's behind the perception of color. So let's get started. And so we're going to talk about what we mean by color, that color is a perceived idea and that we've uh, made up our own definitions of what colors mean. And then we'll get into the science behind color, the quantitative color systems, including the Commission Internationale on, on color. And that gets into the CIE tristimulus values and, and chromaticity coordinates. And then we'll see how we've standardized this for re red, green, blue pixels in all of our displays and then even in our printing. And then we'll look at other color systems, and then we'll look at different color, uh, different colorants. Uh, we've got a whole lecture on the different chromophores that produce color, and so for those, I would re uh, refer you to uh, that lecture, and it's online as well. <clears throat> so color perception is a learned behavior. Um, I was curious, but not. I didn't want to mess up my children, but I wanted. You know, you could, as a parent, perhaps. Uh, teach a child that red is blue and blue is red because the words red and blue have no physical connection to the perception of color. It's a learned behavior and so that's why we have all of these little children's toys that teach the different colors. Uh, but the system is purely artificial. These are just the agreed upon words for these various sensory perceptions that we have with our eyes. And that becomes a problem when you get away from the primary colors. In other words, when you're talking about dusty rose or puce, what do those words mean if you've never seen that color? And, and not only that, but sometimes the difference between driftwood and sand in terms of off-white colors is just lost on me. So it, you would have to have a fine sense of perception to tell the difference between those two. And a lot of these are just marketing, different marketing names. And so it would be nice to have a quantitative measurement of color that could be corresponding to our perceptions of color, but even if we were colorblind, we should be able to get the same numbers from the same color. <coughs> and so I say that these systems are purely agreed upon. There are some exceptions as seen here. <laughs> Uh, in an effort to standardize the different colors, uh, the company uh, Pantone came up with the Pantone color system. And they have color chips and color cards that you can buy, and even uh, standard, these little plastic chips that you have these large notebooks, and they have every kind of color in the Pantone color system. And so you will see the Pantone color system called out. Uh, the most frequent place you might come across it is if you're with an organization and they have official colors and they will have a Pantone color designation for that official color and nowadays they're starting to list CMYK uh, values which are the, the printer values and also RGB values. <coughs> Let's talk about how to quantify color. Uh, I'm, I got interested in this work when I worked with Pantex and they had an acceptance standard on a particular explosive that it needed to be burnished gold for you to accept this shipment of explosive. And that was a problem because how do you train people in what burnished gold is? You have to train them in what the color of this good explosive looks like and then show them examples of bad explosives. But in terms of describing that in a procedure, they had to come up with words for what good and bad were. And so good was described as burnished gold. Well, I had no idea what that was. And, and I wanted to quantify that. And so that set me down this road of studying the quantification of color. And this goes quite far back. If you look at it, 1931, a French uh, committee or this commission on color was, uh, was started. And so we have this 1931 standard for the tristimulus values. And it standardized all three components to color perception. You know, colors will change slightly if you have a slightly different illumination. And so you have to specify the illumination. Are you talking about a, a like a tungsten halogen lamp? Something that's an incandescent bulb, which has a little bit of redder tone to it? Or are you dealing with a xenon lamp, like a, 
a modern car headlamp, uh, that's going to give you different illumination and it's going to give you a different color perception on, on the viewing side of that. Or maybe you have fluorescent tube lights or these curly bulbs. You have different perceptions related to those illuminants too. Or maybe bright sunlight or maybe cloudy. So you also see this uh, these settings on cameras like my Canon uh, Rebel uh, SLR camera has different settings based upon the different illuminations. So I can set it for fluorescent lights or for incandescent lights and it puts a different filter on there to try to correct for the difference in illumination. The standard observer. <coughs> now what this means is, uh, we'll see in a minute, is the different color perceptions in the standard eye. So they needed to standardize the uh, phenomenon of different observers. And so when we talk about the standard observer, we'll see actually standard observer functions as a function of wavelength and how much of uh, perception you have per wavelength. And then the standard sample and observation geometry. You know, the, the, the um, retina has the cones and rod cells and they're not evenly distributed. You have this small area in the middle of your retina that is uh, very perceptive of color. And so you need to narrow down the color sample for the standard observer to a two degree field of view. And so it's straight on observation of color. And that's the, the things that the uh, Commission on Color has standardized. And this gives us numerical data. So we can have standard profiles these curves that are a function of wavelength for the illumination sources, whether it be a hot lamp, a cooler lamp, or a fluorescent lamp. We have standard pigment functions that are supposed to match the pigments in a human eye. And then standard color spaces that catch the full range of, of colors that are perceived by the eye. And so here we have different illumination profiles. So we have a uh, sort of a daylight at, at 5,000 uh, Kelvin, D50, or a daylight at 6,500 Kelvin. So that's about a bit bluer. The 6,500, you see that's the, the large dashes here. So that's the 6,500 profile. This solid black one is the 5,000 Kelvin profile. Again, trying to match the sunlight's profile. Um, C here is a, like a fluorescent illuminant, and then this A is like a tungsten halogen lamp, and you see it's bright in the red and not so bright in the blue. So it's going to be a more yellow light, whereas the fluorescent tube light is going to be much more blue in color. This will change how you perceive the colors. And so you need to match the illumination with the perception of the colors. <coughs> This is the geometry uh, standard. And so when I talk about the, the two degree standard observer, they have, this is really also a way to set up the experiment. And so you have the, um, the color in question here, shining on this white screen with a partition here, and that light enters the eye and you have this masking screen so that all they can see is this two degree field of view and half of that field of view is the color in question and the other half is made up of red green and blue lamps and so the observer will turn knobs on the red the green and the blue until these screens match each other in color what's interesting about that is you can set this to a particular wavelength and you could shine at 400 nanometer light and then that person can turn the knobs on here and they can predominantly turn on the blue and then we'll see how much of the blue lamp is needed to get 400 nanometer light and how little of the green and the red lamp and when they plot these out this red green and blue lamp they actually get the spectrum of the pigments in the eye so the electrical impulses in the brain are a function of the pigments in the eye and the pigments in the eye are being stimulated by these three colors and they're using the signals the knob settings on these three colors will give us the relative absorption values of the three pigments in the eye for each wavelength 
So this is really a, a fascinating way to map out what's inside the eye using this mechanical setup. And this is the way they were able to map out the standard observer functions of the pigments in the eye without even having to isolate them. And so this is kind of a, a nice picture of this. You have the, the, the uh, lamp with uh, some sort of monochromator shining this particular wavelength of light here and then the observer adjusting the three knobs to get the exact same color and these are the three standard, obser obs uh, the standard uh, observer functions. And so if you were to pick a wavelength, say here at uh, see 400, 500, 600, 700, so this is about 600 nanometer light, and the observer would turn, in, turn on some green and turn on some red and turn the blue all the way down. And these would essentially be the settings of the knobs on those three lamps and this would map out the, the absorption spectrum or the, the sensitivity spectrum of the pigments in the eye. And then this is the D65 illuminant. Okay, so that would be the map of, of the uh, bright daylight illumination. <clears throat> and so this uh, this ASTM E308 details the procedure for transforming any visible spectrum into the tristimulus values. And this X, Y, and Z would be the amount of the X spectrum, the red, the Y spectrum, which is the green, or the Z spectrum, which is the blue, that contributes to any spectrum that's collected in terms of transmittance. So let's look at the math behind generating these standard color values. So these X, Y, and Z values will be a standard set of three numbers that will correspond to the visible stimulus that comes from a colored substance. And so here it is mapped on sort of a rainbow uh, background to give you an idea of where the colors are in a, in a visible spectrum. So you have deep blue here or violet, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. <clears throat> and so here's some crepe paper. So if you go to the party store and look at crepe paper, we have all the different colors here. We have yellow crepe paper. And so this is the, the uh, transmittance or reflectance spectrum, actually, of yellow crepe paper. Here's the orange crepe paper. Okay. The green, notice that the reflectance spectrum is not very high. Uh, it doesn't reflect very much light at all, but your eye is so sensitive to green that this little bit of green light reflecting off that paper is enough for your eye to really be stimulated and to say, wow, that's a bright green color. Uh, the brown paper gives you very little of red and a little bit of blue, but because it gives you very little light, it looks black. So it's kind of like a, a red-blue mix, but very dim. That's, that's what we perceive as brown. And then the blue crepe paper is shown here. So it's mostly blue and a little bit of violet, almost no red in the, in the blue paper, as you might imagine. And then this was standardized against white paper. So at all wavelengths, white was set to be a, a reflectance of one or a perfect reflector. <clears throat> and so let's look at how, how we measure color. So let's look at the experimental setups for the different color measurements. Now I talked about collecting the data with transmittance values. That's if your if your uh, colored substance is, is um, allows light to go through, and you can see on the other side what color it what you perceive the color to be. So all wavelengths of light hit this colored substance, and when they pass through, only the blue survives because it's a blue object. And then you have the amount of light that's transmitted, and the amount of light that an in incident uh, that hit it, we call that the incident light. And this ratio of transmitted over incident gives us the transmittance value. <clears throat> the amount of light drops off exponentially, and so one way to look at that is to um, is to take the, the minus log of the transmittance, the natural log, and so we have the natural log of transmittance value, which we call absorbance. Now we also have diffuse reflectance where the incident light hits a colored substance and then all of the angles 
the light that comes off at all angles other than the preserved angle um, or the um, yeah the, the angle of incidence we'll see in a second what uh, what specular reflectance looks like but diffuse reflectance is all angles other than the specular reflectance angle and so then we have this uh, diffuse reflectance here or this intensity of the scattered light divided by the incident light but in terms of reflectance we need to have some standards and so we will have a black substance that's supposed to absorb all wavelengths of light and we have a white substance that's supposed to reflect all wavelengths of light and so we scale these by the black value and divide by the white value so we really don't want to scale it by the incident light we want to scale it by the reflected light off of a white substance and so this is how we calculate the reflectance, the diffuse reflectance. <coughs> and in order to get all of the light outside this port without seeing any of the incident light, we typically pick a, a place that's 90 degrees and we have it inside an integrating sphere that's coated in a white substance. So the white standard bounces off the inside of a white integrating sphere and the light comes out 90 degrees. So we're not looking directly at the source. So this is how we calculate the diffuse reflectance value. We take the scattered light and subtract the black va uh, light value, and we take the white standard and subtract the black or blank value as well. So this ratio gives us the diffuse reflectance value. Then specular reflectance. When I said the angle is preserved, the reflectance is normal to the surface. And so if it comes in at a 45 degree angle, normal to the surface, it will leave at a 45 degree angle normal to the surface. And so again we take this with a with a, a black standard and a white standard and then we have our our in our colored substance that we're interrogating. And so this would be the specular reflectance. Now the total reflectance would be the sum of these two. And we can use this value for other forensically valid results. This is a great measure to this is a great way to measure the roughness of a surface. Okay, and so if the surface is incredibly smooth, your uh, specular reflectance value will be very high, and your diffuse reflectance value will be very low. If your surface is very rough, then the opposite will will be the case. You'll have a very low specular reflectance and a very high diffuse reflectance. Okay, and so the way to measure a measure of surface roughness would be the um, um, if you want a high number for roughness, then you would take the diffuse reflectance divided by the total, which would be the sum of these two. Now we can do this uh, in a fantastic way with fiber optic detection. They make these very small portable um, uh, specular reflectance or just uh, in, you know uh, UV vis spectrometers now. A company that we've used is Ocean Optics. They make a, a great portable uh, visible spectrometer. It comes with an integrated source and it goes through a fiber optic, bounces off your different standards in your sample and comes back through a fiber optic into a spectrometer that has a fixed um, grading a monochromator and a diode array. So there are no moving parts, nothing to break. Uh, the fiber optic is the only thing that may be fragile. You don't want to kink it and bust the glass inside the fiber optic. But this is a, a can be run on a battery and can uh, sync data with a small you know, PC, uh, laptop, and you can take this to, to a scene and you can collect reflectance and color data on the, on the go. And so here's an example of one. And so this is a nice setup because it's got a little stage and everything. You've got uh, different color standards that you can use. Excuse the, the poor resolution, but you have the, the source of light here. Uh, it goes through an attenuator just to make sure that it's not going to blind the detector. And so you can adjust the brightness of the source using this little screen. It comes down, it illuminates the sample, and then the light comes back through what we call a bifurcated probe. So it has one fiber going and six fibers coming back, and those six fibers go into the spectrometer. And this is actually a larger version. They make smaller ones. So, And then this looks like they have some arson cans here. I'm not exactly sure you know, necessarily what, what color measurements would do with arson cans, but uh, anyway, 
I think they just set up their nice little scene here. So we have the halogen lamp source, an attenuator, the sample, and the spectrometer, and then the black and white reference standards. Now we probably learned some things about color analysis um, in earlier classes, maybe your freshman year in chemistry, or maybe even high school chemistry, using the color wheel. And those, so they said if a, if a particular spectrum shows an absorption in the yellow, then it will present as a violet substance. Or if it absorbs in the blue, it's going to be an orange substance. And that's okay. I mean, that works. But what if there are two absorption peaks? And what if they're different intensities? And so this uh, basic color analysis is not very useful at all. Uh, it's just more of like a um, more like an exercise in, in, in understanding that if something absorbs orange, it's going to present as blue, either in transmittance or in reflectance. But beyond that, this isn't quantitative enough to be useful. This is why we need to go with the, uh, the CIE tristimulus values, those X, Y, and Z values to quantify color. And so let's look at a better scheme for color analysis. This is a, that ASTM E308 standard. So we can take these different colored solutions and put them in a visible spectrometer and collect transmittance spectra. And so like this purple one, this is permanganate, potassium permanganate, would provide us a spectrum like this when collected in transmittance. And so this clear solution would be one straight across, 100% transmittance, and then this is that potassium permanganate spectrum. And so how do we turn this into the tristimulus values, the X, Y, and Z tristimulus values? Well, this is how we do that. We, we determine the CIE tristimulus values, and then if we wish, we can transform them into red, green, blue values, and then convert to 8-bit values for display on a computer screen. And so these are the standard RGB values for potassium permanganate. So 186, 0, 168. So out of 255 range on the red, we have 186. Out of 0 to 255 on the green, we have 0. And out of 0 to 255 on the blue, we have 168. So this now is a, a standard uh, numerical value for this color, for potassium permanganate. So let's see about these different steps. Let's look at them in detail. And so this uh, is analogous to these definitions of the three primary colors. We can fit these spectra with the functions to see how much of each color is needed to make up the unknown spectrum. Now this is similar to what the paint salesman's doing in the at the uh, hardware store. And so they take a spectrum of your paint and then they have a recipe instead of the, the uh, standard observer functions, they have the spectra of each pigment that's available in their little assortment and it will spit out the amount of pigment needed to perfectly match your paint. And so we take the visible spectrum that we have for the potassium permanganate and we want to see with this illumination how much of the blue would be needed and with this illumination how much the green would be needed and this illumination how much red and so we have these three different um, if you will uh, different convolution integrals these are numerical integrals <coughs> and then we have this standard illumination function in the, in the denominator so we have the result spectrum we have the illumination spectrum and we have the uh, X observer function. And these are all functions of wavelength. And so for 400 nanometers, we have a value here times a value here at 400 times a value here at 400. All divided by the sum of the illumination times the Y illumination value. And then for the X, notice everything's the same. The only thing that's changed is the Y uh, uh, standard observer function. And then for the Z, the only thing that's changed is now the Z illumination function. These three sum product integrals okay, will give us the capital X, Y, and Z values. This is the, this is the formulas that you could use in Excel or maybe even in uh, Google, she uh, Google Sheets <coughs> that would give you these different functions. <coughs> Okay.
And so from those three values, we can convert to the RGB values. Now, red, green, blue, this is a more modern definition. And so this did not come around until the 1993 International Color Consortium. If you think about it, the XYZ standard is more for quantifying the visible or the, the visual perception of color. And then along came all of these color producing uh, phenomena like uh, screens, like uh, uh, this cathode ray tube for monitors for computing, um, projectors, camera elements that would capture color and imaging. And so we have all of these companies like Adobe and Apple and Microsoft and others that wanted to get together to agree on the conversion of XYZ values over to RGB values so that everybody would use the same standard. And so that's what this International Color Consortium developed. They produce worldwide standards for color management. And what I mean by color management means if I take a photograph with a camera, that needs to produce standard RGB values on the digital file. So that when I take those standard RGB values on the digital file and print them on a printer, I get the same color that the camera saw. And so that's color management. Same thing, if I take a picture with a camera, that standard value on the, on the file should also be displayed in a standard manner so that the color coming off of a monitor is the color that the camera saw. Or if I'm an artist, the color I see in my head that I, that I fine tune with my digital drawing tools needs to print out the exact color that I wanted in my head or display on a screen. So color management is incredibly important, not just for marketing and for art, but think about the forensic application. Uh, there's an example at Pantex when they had me present the work for, um, for the group. So they had about 10 or 20 scientists working on this project, but really only funding for one person to go to the meeting to present the poster session that had the, the work from all of these people. They sent me the, the pictures of all of the data that we had collected, and this one particular explosive, the pictures they showed uh, from the beginning of the aging process to the end of the aging process, was um, it went from white to pink. And so the colors in this picture were pink. And then they sent me along their findings and I was reading through the report that I was going to have to then relay at the poster session. And they talked about this aging process producing brown explosives. And so it went from white to brown. But the photographs that they took definitely showed pink, not brown. And so if I did not have their written report, I would have misrepresented the results. I would have said, you see with age, this explosive begins to turn pink. And that, that could have been you know, devastating because people would be looking at the aging process at other facilities and say, we're not seeing any pink color, but we are seeing brown color. So this, this in, and likewise, if you imagine in, in the court, you know, the difference between brown and red may be the difference between a blood stain and not a blood stain. So uh, color management is incredibly important. That's why we need to know about these different types of uh, uh, color analyses and the importance of cameras accurately reproducing and printers accurately reproducing color. So they've defined this device independent standard for an RGB color space that's based upon X, Y, and Z. So they didn't reinvent the wheel. They took the Commission on Color from 1931 and they updated it with the standard RGB values. So with our scientific tools we can measure X, Y, and Z and then this is the agreed upon matrix that will turn X, Y, and Z values into RGB values. So if you're rusty on this let me just run through it very quickly. The way you do matrix multiplication is that you take these top three values, 3.2 and minus 1.5 and minus 0.5, and you multiply those by these three values. And so if I have a spectrum that produced an X, Y, and Z um, pair, or, you know, triple of numbers, I take 3.2 times the X value and add that to minus 1.5 times the Y value and add that to minus 0.5 times the Z value. And all three of those 
numbers up and that gives me the R value. So if you want to think about it, R contains these portions of X, Y, and Z. Notice it contains mostly X and in fact it takes a little bit away from the Y and the Z value because those are negative. Now for the G value, it's these middle three. So it's mostly the Y value, a tiny bit of the Z value, and it takes away some of the red value. And that turns it into the standard G value. And then the blue, as you see, it's mostly the Z value, takes away a little bit of the green, adds in a tiny amount of the red. And so that, those three numbers times these three numbers added together will give us the blue value for the standard S RGB. Now these are going to still be roughly on a, a 0 to 1 scale, uh, but some will go a little bit up above 1. And so what we want to do then is we want to turn these into 8-bit color values. Um, 8 bits uh, in binary will give us 0 to 255. And so we can display these on to a computer screen by taking these sRGB values and multiplying them by uh, 255 and then capping it at 255 if it goes above that. Uh, one other way to plot this data is with the chromaticity coordinates. The tri-stimulus values can be converted into an XY or two-dimensional plot called a chromaticity diagram. And we don't really use the Z, but we use the X and Y. And so here we have the capital X value divided by the sum of all three, and the little y coordinate is the capital Y or uppercase Y divided by the sum of all three. And then you can plot those here. So this is the X value, the lowercase X value, and this is the lowercase Y value. And so we have the white point here, and all of these values here around 0.34 and, and about 0.3, that's going to be white. But notice if I have um, a large X value, like maybe 60% of the total, of all three values is, is the X value, then I'm going to be over here in the red. Um, what about um, if most of it's Y, that's going to be green. So if I have mostly like 70% Y and in the, in the, out of the total, then I'm going to be a very green color. If I have some mixture of, of X and Y, then I'm going to be yellow. If I'm deficient in both X and Y, then the only option is that it's in Z. And so they see why we can get blue out of this two-dimensional plot. If both X and Y are, are small values, that means Z has to be big. And so that would put us in this blue region. What I've shown here is a color gamut for uh, those um, different solutions that I had earlier. So here's that potassium permanganate color. Now we can... Um, do this in a spreadsheet. And so here's the actual data for those crepe paper values that I had. Now our spectrometer collects data here at, you know, very small values of nanometers. You know, it looks like about 0.22 nanometers between each data point. But the ASTM E308 has data spaced every five nanometers. So that's really the only, re the, the resolution that you need on a spectrometer. So you don't need a high resolution spectrometer. Plus or minus, uh, having a digital resolution of five nanometers is, is fine and that will match the ASTM. So if you had this data, you would want to reduce the resolution of the spectrum down to, plus, down to five nanometers. And so here we have that, uh, 400, 405, 410, etc. So here are the transmittance values for these different papers. And uh, you can see it's scaled to white. So white is one all the way across. And then we can use uh, this VLOOKUP to reduce that data set. And then we have the observer functions. So these can be downloaded from this uh, uh, CIE site. And we have the standard illumination profile for D65, so daylight with 6500 Kelvin uh, uh, temperature. And then we also want to type in that International Color Consortium Coefficient Matrix. We'll use this later. But when we get our X, Y, and Z values, then we can use the matrix multiplication functions in Excel to convert those X, Y, Z values into standard RGB values. And so here we have all of the data. So we, we did those, those uh, 
those integrals using the sum product function. So here's the sum product of those different functions. We had the visible spectrum, we had the illumination profile, and we had the actually this is the illumination profile and this is the X observer function and that's divided by the sum product of the Y standard observer function and the illumination profile and that gives us our X value, our capital X value. Then the the uh, Y tristimulus value everything would be the same only we would be using the Y observer function and the capital Z one would be the same function but we would be using the Z observer function. And so then we um, get these three values for our blue crepe paper. And you can see capital X, capital Y, capital Z is a small value for X, small value for Y, and a large value for Z. So that gives us a blue color. For brown, it's small in all of them. You can see green has quite a bit of green and quite a bit of, of blue the red over here, uh, so here's yellow, it has quite a bit of red and quite a bit of green and very little blue. Here's the orange, more red, less yellow, less blue. Now for the uh, uh, cho chromaticity coordinates, again we don't need to put the Z on here but we can take the X value divided by the sum of all three and that will give us the, l the lowercase x chromaticity coordinate value. Taking all three of these values and multiplying by that matrix gives us the standard RGB values. And so here we have that function using mmult, so matrix multiplication in Excel, and it has the, uh, the sRGB coefficient matrix, that's that 3 by 3 conversion matrix, comma, and then this blue paper three values here C2 through C4 close parentheses and the thing about the the mmult you select all three values where you want the matrix result to go you type in the formula or click and drag and then you hit control shift enter so when whenever you're entering a formula that's supposed to go into multiple cells that's called an array formula and you have to use control shift enter to fill all three cells with that mmult result. Okay, I have a Excel bootcamp video on this, so if you're on the uh, PCHEM channel at Sam Houston State University, you can look at the Excel bootcamp related to matrix multiplication. And so this gives us the standard RGB values, but notice that they're not in 8-bit values. These are decimal places and so on. And so we need to take these the, each of these values and multiply by 255. And so this 8-bit value ranges from 8 zeros to 8 ones and the decimal equivalents of these are go from 0 to 255. And so each this is for 24-bit color values so there's three color values with 8 bits each so there's your 24-bit encoding for color and that's a there are higher color spaces, but this is good enough for, for the computer screens that we typically deal with. And it's certainly, I would say, good enough for our eye. Where black is 0, 0, 0, and white is 255, 255, 255. So if you had a negative value, like you do over here, uh, that would be uh, truncated at 0. And if it went over uh, 1, then it would be truncated at 255. And so you can actually put in if-then statements in Excel. So if C8 is less than zero, that comma means you shift over to the it then, okay? So let me read this again. If C8, which is this cell, is less than zero, then the answer is zero. Else. So the next comma means else. If it's not equal or not less than zero, what do you do? You can put in another if-then statement. If C8 is greater than one, then 255. So what this has done is it set the floor at zero, set the ceiling at 255, and if it's between the floor and the ceiling, then you just take that value and multiply by 255. So let me read the whole statement again. If C8 is less than zero, then make it zero. Else, if C8 is greater than one, then make it 255. Else, 
take C8 and multiply by 255. Then you close both parentheses and hit enter. You don't have to hit control shift enter on this one. This is just a single cell value and it will give you the 8-bit conversion of this standard RGB value. Now in the old days we had cathode ray monitors and they had a, a nonlinear response to illumination. So the electron current hitting that phosphor was uh, going to be governed by how strong the color value was for that pixel. And it was a nonlinear uh, response. And so this was a way to correct for what they called gamma. Now, you may need to read up on whether your monitor or your printer or your projector needs gamma correction. If it needs gamma correction, then this is the gamma correction formula. <clears throat> so how would we display these 8-bit color values? Well, there's a bunch of different ways, but in just about any Microsoft tool, you can draw a shape, okay, and then you can click on that shape and change the fill color and go to more fill colors. And then here you have custom color, the RGB model, and you can type in those standard 8-bit RGB values right here. And when you hit OK, then you get the color for that standard RGB value. So this is a great way to take a spectrum of some something, convert it over to standard RGB values, and then you can draw objects with that standard RGB value. You can print it out as evidence for the jury and so on. And you will have confidence that you've walked through the standards so that that color is uh, accurately converted from your spectrum to the, um, to the exhibit. And, and so you would be able to answer questions about, is this exhibit the real color of what was captured by the camera or what was seen in this particular solution? Let's say you had a colored solution. This would be a way to capture the color of that solution in a standard way. It's probably better than photography. Because photography, you're going to have to standardize the illumination, which is going to be very difficult if it's at the scene. You can include a color card. And so that's one way to do it. If you could adjust the color card so that it accurately reproduces the RGB values for those colors on the color card, then you would have accurately produced the unknown color. If it's the same kind of substance, if you're using a, a printed color card in reflectance color and you're trying to analyze, say, a, a a flask of colored liquid, uh, then you're looking at transmittance color through the liquid and reflective color on the color card, and that may cause problems. So it would be better to take a transmittance spectrum of the liquid and convert it to these standard RGB values. Uh, there's other software that you can use to manage your colors and analyze your colors, and this is ImageJ. It can be downloaded for free. Um, this is the color. Oh, this is the computer lab we have in our building, so that's not relevant for you. But um, but you can go to rsb.info.nih.gov/ij for ImageJ, or you can just Google ImageJ, and you can download this software. and It has some fantastic features, including color analysis. Uh, one way that you can take is a, is a um, you take your spectrum. And you can highlight a region of the spectrum. And you can come over here and do a color histogram. And it will give you the red and the green and the blue channels. And it will tell you what the different values are for those. Um, so this will tell you the RGB value for all of these red pixels, sort of the, the average value for those. And it will be 169, 0, and 30. So that's an analysis of the image. And then you could take this and run it through the spectrum analysis and the Excel spreadsheet tools that I just taught you and compare the two. And so here we have the spectral analysis on top and the image analysis using ImageJ on bottom. And here are the RGB values that we got. So the spectral analysis gave us 0, 01672 and the image of the blue crepe paper gave us 0, 020 and 85. Not too bad. Here for the brown paper 30, 16 and 3 and this gave us 30, 10, and 0. Still pretty good. Uh, 0, 40, 32. 0, 50, 40. 
uh, for the orange paper, 164, 17, 4, and for the image analysis, 175, 25, and 6. And for the white paper, the transmittance values, pretty much all 255, and then the white value for the image analysis, 255. Now, these are different, but is it significant? Well, um, there's some papers that you can see that tell you the perception of each of these values like and you can even test this too you could you could make color swatches with both of these colors and see if you can perceive a difference and and for these they're too close you would not perceive the difference between these different color values maybe a little bit but not not much um, and so, uh, but also, which one do you trust then? Let's say you perceive a color difference between these two. You need to trust the, the uh, reflectance values because those have been standardized. Photography is notoriously difficult to standardize. Whereas this is an actual spectrum of the color response of all of these different uh, standard illumination values and standard observer functions. And so this one has the stronger pedigree in terms of science. Uh, cameras uh, can be corrected if you have a color card. And there's actually a, a, a working group, a standard scientific group for image analysis, and you would want to follow their guidelines. But uh, this uh, standard color values uh, of spectral analysis would be the gold standard. And so we could compare this to the digital image. Uh, these are the different XY, uh, the RGB values that came from these different uh, image for these images. Uh, these are the spectral results, and these are the image analysis results. And you can kind of perceive a difference here, uh, but this camera was a $30 webcam taken at two different brightness levels, and so it's not a very high dollar camera. But these are the results that came from the spectral analysis. They do match pretty well. And so now you, you must document what you do if you adjust your images in any way. But one way to do that too is these are the scientifically rigid and valid results for the colors of these solutions. And so if you were going to present a photograph, you would want to document it, but you could adjust the, the brightness and contrast of this image so that these values match. Let's look at that chromaticity diagram. This is what we call a color gamut, and these are the standard color values on a PC. And so this dot corresponds to the red, this is the bright green value, and this is the bright or the, the bright um, or the dark blue value. So what are the other six sort of primary colors in the computer value? So if you take um, let's take the RGB, so this would be 25500. Zero, zero. Okay, and this would be 0 for the red, 255 for the green, and 0 for the blue. And this one would be 0, 0, 255. Well, what if you put two of those values all the way up? Well, this would be 255, 255, and 0. So that bright yellow is actually the red and the green displayed together. So you heard that, that uh, um, yellow and blue make green. Well, in this case, red and green make yellow. And right there's the, the red and the green. The red and the green added together. So 255, 255. And this is illumination. So the source is giving you those two colors, and your eye perceives it as, as yellow. Okay, what if you took the, the green and the blue and matched them out? So you had zero red, 255 on the green, 255 on the blue. That would be this bright cyan color, this bright blue. And then what if you had zero green and 255 on the red, 255 on the blue, that would be this pink color or magenta color. And so this is the full color gamut. Since you can't go higher than 255, these are the only colors that can be produced by a computer screen. So even though it shows green out here, it's really not that that green's really not different than this color. Like so it's the same all the way out. Even though your eye might be able to perceive a different green out here, maybe in nature, it's not able to be produced by a color monitor or a projector or a printer. If these are the 
the accurate values for those different media. And so that's why nature sometimes to us appears so much richer. We actually get colors in nature that we can't get from a computer monitor or a projector or the uh, output of a printer. And so this is, a, again, an, another reason to go outside. So here are just some different labels. Like I said, we've assigned these colors. Um, and so if you look here, we have uh, red, purple, purplish pink, yellow, green, reddish orange, all of these different color names that we've given inside the chromaticity diagram. This is a wonderful uh, addition to the chromaticity diagram here. This is called the incan <coughs> incandescence curve. And so a hot object or a black body radiator will start to illuminate red. If you think about your burner and your stove, it starts becoming red and it starts to get a little bit more yellow as it heats up. So when that burner is orange, it's about 1700 Kelvin. If it gets bright yellow, then it's maybe getting close to 2850. Um, if it got white hot, then it would be up here at 4,800 to 6,500 Kelvin. In fact, it would probably be melting at that point. But anyway, this, this is the incandescence curve. And so your incandescent lights will follow this line in the chromaticity coordinate diagram. And so this, um, you can see the different illuminate, uh, standard illuminance. So an A, B, and C standard a, B, and uh, D standard illumination profile follows this incandescent line. And so this is the white point right here in the middle. When we go to D65, notice it's a little bit more blue than white. Now let's talk about some other different color spaces. Okay, So this is the LAB color space. Hue is color. Lightness is also understood as brightness and chroma is how strong the color is, how far away. So the lightness, the, the A and B values are hue, and chroma is how far out it is on that, that line. So if you just have lightness and A and B, then A and B are kind of like this X coordinate here. So you can have positive values of A and negative values of A, and that would be the red and green uh, axis, and the B values positive B would be yellow and negative B would be blue and then how bright it is so if it was 0 L would be black and you know high values of L would be white and you can see for different illumination values L 75 50 and 25 you see how this is darker and this is lighter and this is just showing you the color gamut at dark values you have these different uh, subdued tones and at high uh, luminosity values or lightness or brightness values, you start to see a white point here. Or it's a little bit gray. You see the red go to more of a pink, the, the, and the a little lighter orange, a lighter blue, a lighter green. So again, with this, you you can color you can cover the whole color space with this scheme as well. So this is just a different color scheme than the RGB color scheme or the XYZ color scheme, and you can find conversions from the XYZ to LAB. Here's the Munsell catalog system. And so this was made sort of by the for paints uh, by the by Albert Munsell in 1905. So this even predates the CIE. And here you can see similar it's kind of a similar system where you get got a circular system and then a black to white scale. And these uh these values, if you remember back at the color spot test for drugs, we had some Munsell color systems based upon the different drug spot tests. Next, let's clear up something in in our terminology. You know, sometimes um, when you know we, like I said, you heard that that yellow and blue make green, and here in this case we have a. Uh, for, for subtractive color and reflection, like for paints, yes, if you mix yellow paint and, and a cyan paint, the, the mixture would be green. Um, but in, in, in terms of illumination, <clears throat> our light source is actually green. And in order to get yellow, we have to add in a light source that's red. And so red and green light will produce a yellow perception in our eye. 
and if you mix all three light sources you get white if you mix all three paints that paint will absorb all three and it will produce as gray or black now we've got um, this notice this black isn't totally black um, and so a lot of times in printing formulations we have our colors and we also have black so it's a little bit more um, uh, it's, I guess would say a redundant system you don't get black from mixing all three colors uh, you have the colors that are useful for the different color values but then if you need a black then you can mix in a black let's think now about colorants in our printing systems we have uh, dyes and pigments and the really the only difference between a dye and a pigment is the carrier and the solubility of that molecule in the carrier. If it's soluble in the carrier, it's a dye. If it's just suspended in that carrier, then it's a pigment. Okay. And so a molecule could be either one. It just depends upon the solvent. We've got a whole lecture on, on a color spot test for drugs where we talk about the different colorimetric substances in their chromophores. We have azo and carbonyl and nitro and, and uh, triaromethines and so on. So go look at that lecture for these different things. Um, you can also cate categorize them by their solubility, whether they're acidic or cationic or anionic, etc. Um, whether they're direct application where you spray a suspension directly onto the medium, uh, that would be for like a paint or an ink. You could use the cast number for that molecule if it's known so that you know you have exactly the same molecule. And then there's also color index numbers that are maintained by these different organizations. Let's talk a little bit about the different things. You have the colorant and an ink. You also have this, the, the solvent. Most of the time they like to have water-soluble inks and, and colors because water is a, is a, a good carrier and for environmental and health and safety reasons the manufacturers would prefer to deal with water rather than a flammable substance like a MEK or, or a methanol so it's not necessarily the performance of the product it may be the production facility where they want to reduce their risk to fire or health concerns with their workers you could also have additives and for classification these may be very forensically important let's think about also mechanical printing and so we have a lot of um, you know reproduction machines copiers so you have this uh, electrostatically charged drum and you can take an image off of the scanner and charge that drum with the pattern and that paper is is uh, rolled along that drum and the toner is transferred to the paper and then that toner is sort of melted or fused onto the paper in the fuser which is a really hot region it's got a really hot wire in there that that sort of uh, fuses or melts that toner onto the paper and permanently attaches it to the paper uh, so you have different ways of attaching print to paper or images to paper and these again can be very forensically relevant and so you would need to know these different kinds of techniques. Let's talk a little bit about paint. So you might hear the term latex paint. And latex in the context of paint really just means an aqueous dispersion. You know, we talked in the um, illicit drugs lecture about the latex of the, of the poppy plant. And that was the... Um, any of the plant-like sap or milk that comes out of the pods, the seed pods of the poppy plant, that latex has morphine, it's like 10% morphine. Well this uh, may have been the original term used for the term latex, and latex paint has that natural rubber polymer that comes out of the tree sap. Uh, that might be the origin of it, but now it's been treated so that it's water soluble. So now, for, for nowadays, the term latex paint just really means an aqueous dispersion of these polymeric uh, uh, binders, and then you mix in the pigments. Uh, most of the pigments are like titanium oxide for the white base, and then you mix in colored molecules that get entrained in that titanium oxide as it dries, and that gives you a good colored paint. 
So latex rubbers, that sap of that rubber tree, has typically been called latex, but that's not the ingredient for this paint. It is some sort of polymeric binder, though. So you mix in this, um, this binder, this polymeric binder, and then the colorimetric particles. So it could be the, the, um, the white particles, like the titanium oxide, and then the colored particles as well. And so when that dries, the, the water evaporates, and some use a cationic polymeric, polymeric process, others use uh, maybe a free radical process, but anyway, that film polymerizes and binds those colored particles to the surface. And that's why the surface cleanliness, and this is my research, as you can see behind me, the cleanliness of that surface is key because this film is going to form, but will it adhere to the surface? It will only adhere to the surface if there's entanglement of the polymer with the surface. And so if you have um, like a paper-coated drywall surface or a mudded surface, like a textured surface, it's very easy for that paint to bind to that rough surface. If you have a shiny metal surface, it's going to be very difficult for that paint to bind to that surface. You're going to need a very fine polymer that's compatible with the metal oxide, and you may need a solvent that wets the metal to drive those particles into the metal oxide surface to get it to bind. And if the surface is too much of a mirror finish, guess what you have to do? You have to sand the whole surface to make it rough so that the paint will stick. Okay. I don't exactly know the forensic application of that information, but the, um, the film on a surface, is a, that adhesion area is really important. Now, there, there may be a forensic application when you get to automotive paints because you have a very smooth surface from the pressed metal in automotive, and so you're going to need some sort of primer coat, something on that surface that's compatible with the paint. And so you need the metal surface coated with some kind of primer. And then after that primer, then you have the paint, the colored sur surface. And maybe even some decorative metal flaking in a clear binder. And then maybe a surface coating to make that paint um, last longer in an oxidizing atmosphere like we have. And so you have the bare metal. You have a primer one that sticks to the metal very well and puts down a rough polymer coating, primer two that's compatible with primer one, and can let the paint with the colorant bind. So some of these different uh, paint formulations are very complex. And then you may have a clear coat, which is protective. Um, so uh, these different automobile coatings have forensic application, as you might say, because they might be the same color to the eye, but they might have different numbers of, of uh, primers or a different type. Maybe they have metal flake and it's very subtle and you don't necessarily see it with your eye, but you might be able to see it with a spectroscopic technique. Now, how are you going to get these layers here? It's a very difficult thing to analyze sometimes. And so what we have to do is analyze a cross-section of this. So you can take a cross-section and cut that and analyze it, say with an ATR on the edges of the layers, but that's still very difficult to do. And so what, what they'll do a lot of times is they'll cut a diagonal. Let me see if I can show with the, with the pen. This is with the mouse, so it may not be great. If you take a, a grinder or a polisher and you grind away a diagonal slice through the paint, then notice what a spot that was only this wide is now this wide. And so you have a, a better uh, width to analyze primer one and primer two and a clear coat. And so this uh, sort of rubbing the paint off in a small area allows you to analyze the different layers. And so hopefully that's a, that's a good overview of the different color systems and the forensic evidence that's available in different paint processes, uh, how to standardize color systems, whether it be transmittance or reflectance, and then using those standard XYZ values and converting them over to standard RGB values so that they can be put into forensic um, exhibits in the courtroom. Have a great day.